In this sermon, continuing the series on ministering healing and deliverance, we address several important questions. Is it God's will to heal every person? Is it right to pray if it be thy will when ministering healing and deliverance? Since God is sovereign, won't he just heal people if and when he wants to? Why doesn't everyone get healed? Why are some healings gradual and some healings partial? And much more. Listen to this important message. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, let's turn the page. Uh, where did we stop? 84, I think, is where we stopped last Sunday. Um, we, we're learning on ministering healing and deliverance. You know, in, in, in times past, and sometimes even in many Christian circles today, uh, the whole idea of, of ministering healing, ministering deliverance, uh, often is, is left aside or kept aside only for, you know, certain uh, anointed ministers of God. People think, wrongly think, that, you know, only certain anointed people, uh, God will use only certain people to bring healing and deliverance. And that's wrong. And so what we're trying to emphasize here is that God really wants to use all of us, each one of us, in bringing healing and deliverance to people. Amen? God can and God desires to use each one of us to do this. Now, yes, there are individuals whom God has called into certain offices in the body. Uh, we are in no way discrediting it. But the fact is God wants to work through each one of us to bring healing, to bring deliverance. And what we desire to see is, is our, our, us as a church being a community that brings healing and deliverance to people in our city and across our nation. That's the journey we're making in, and, and in the process. And in order to make that journey, we are learning and, 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 and understanding the truth of God's word and praying and pressing into it. And one day I believe that truly we will be a community that brings healing and deliverance to our city and our nation. And, and multitudes will come, receive healing, experience the touch of God in their lives and say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? We're making our journey into it, and, and this is just another day, another step in that journey as we press into it. And so we're, we're learning these things. Uh, last Sunday, uh, as we covered the earlier sections in this book, we, uh, on the basis for ministering healing and deliverance, we talked about, you know, some reasons why or, or the basis or the foundation on which we can minister healing and deliverance. On what basis can you pray for somebody uh, who needs healing and deliverance? How can you do it? And so we, uh, uh, we, we, we covered several areas. And here's the point I want to impress on our heart. That the basis for our faith is more solid than any reasons for doubt. Amen? The basis for your faith to bring healing is more solid than any reasons for your doubt. So don't question your faith, question your doubts. Amen? Don't question your faith on, on which you can minister healing and deliverance. That is on solid ground. It's, we've, we've gone through several things on that. So don't question that. Question your doubts. Your doubts are baseless. They have no basis. And so question your doubts, not the basis for your faith uh, to minister healing. Today, this morning, we want to Tackle some difficult questions. We will do that as we go along. Several questions on the subject. And we're going to talk about those questions. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, we will get into more teaching and learning and then come back to more questions as we make this journey. On page 84, starting on page 84, first question that we want to talk about is, is it God's will to heal everyone? Is it God's will to heal everyone? Having understood the basis for healing and deliverance, our hearts must be absolutely settled, convinced that God, yes, God's will is to heal every person. No doubts, no questions. It is God's will to heal every sick person. So, when you're out there 
and you, you encounter a person who's sick, suffering in their body or troubled by demonic powers, your heart must be convinced that God wants to help this person. God wants to minister. Now, on what basis can we say that? On what basis can we say so convincingly that it is God's will to heal every person? Just to summarize, number one, the reason we can say that is because Jesus demonstrated healing for all who came to him. And as we've been emphasizing over and over again, Jesus Christ is the word who became flesh. He is perfect theology, meaning you can't question this. This is God who became man. Everything he said, everything he did is an expression of the will of God. And how did Jesus heal? How did he minister? What do you see in the life and the ministry of Jesus? You never see Jesus making excuses to people. You never see Jesus telling any person, uh, you know, maybe it's the will of God for you to be like this. Never. You never see Jesus telling a sick person, you know, you should have come here yesterday. God was healing people. You never see Jesus telling somebody, only 50 people can receive healing today. No excuses, nothing at all. And so you and I have no basis to make such excuses. In fact, the Bible, and I'm on page 85, the Bible repeatedly states that he healed all who came to him. And we've listed some of these scriptures here in Matthew 4. Now let's run through them very quickly. Matthew 4 verse 24. The Bible says, They brought to him all sick people with various diseases and torments and he healed them. Now Jesus never said, Oh God wants to heal you for you. Sorry. Uh, for this case, yes. For that case, no. Nothing like that. They brought to him all sick people, all kinds of diseases and he healed them. Matthew 8 16. When the evening was come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. He cast the spirits out and he healed all who were sick. Matthew 12, 15. Great multitudes followed him and he healed them. All right, guys. It's okay to speak in church, right? <laughs> and he healed them all. Mark 6, verse 56. It says there... Um, you know, the people brought, they brought the sick into the marketplaces and they begged that they, that they might touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched him were healed. I like this in Luke 440. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases, they brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and Wow, that's like, you can't get better than that. It's like everyone who came, he healed. Now he is perfect theology. This is God at work. What can we learn from that? It is God's will to heal as many, all, with various diseases. That's God's will. That's what he wants. And uh, that. That the moment, there's this one recorded instance when the leper, and I'm on the next page, page 86, where the leper comes to Jesus in Mark, uh, in Matthew and Mark. Uh, he comes and he was questioning the will of God. He said, Lord, if it be your will, make me clean. I know you can make me clean. So he knew God's ability, the Lord's ability, but he was questioning the will. If it's your will. And what's his response? said, let me pray about it. Come back to me tomorrow, I'll tell you. He didn't say that. Immediately, Jesus said, I will be healed. I will. So, in response to any question, is it your will? His response is, I will. I will do it for you. You also see the other highlights about the ministry of Jesus on page 86 here. He healed people outside the covenant. You know, at, when the, Jesus came during his earthly ministry, he was sent to the house of Israel, the people of Israel. But then he even bent the rules. 
There was this Roman centurion who came. There was this uh, Canaanite woman who came. They were not Jewish people. And yet they received healing. They received deliverance simply because they came to him in faith. It was almost like he was bending the rules. He, he was stepping out of God's program in response to faith. And he healed these people. Also, everyone that Jesus healed were unsaved. They were unsaved. They were not born again. And yet they healed them. So we cannot disqualify people from healing just because they are not saved. Doesn't matter. Right? And the only thing that we see that stopped Jesus from receiving uh, working miracles is unbelief. That's the only thing that stopped him. The second reason why we could say that God's will is to heal every person is on page 87. Is the cross is for everyone. Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for every person? Let's hear it again. Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for every person? Which means that everything he did on the cross, he did it for every person. So he bore our sins on the cross so we could be forgiven. And that is for every person. But on the cross, he also took our sicknesses. And by his stripes we heal. So healing is also for every person. We can't say, well, forgiveness of sins is for everyone, but healing is not for everyone. You can't do that. Because everything Jesus did on the cross is for every person. That's why we can say, yes, God's will is to heal everyone. And the third reason we could say is, uh, is because God's promise of salvation is for everyone. See, the Bible says, and you know this verse, Romans 10, 13, whoever means everyone. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, the Greek word that's most commonly used for saved or for salvation is the Greek word sozo. And you will find this on page 88 where the word, same word sozo, saved or salvation is used uh, to talk about forgiveness of sins, it's also used to talk about healing. It's also used to talk about preservation from danger. It's also used to talk about deliverance from demonic powers. And so is for everyone. So salvation is for every person. And that word sozo is the total package. It's like this, you know, when you order pizza. When you think about pizza, what do you think? <laughs> That's part of it. You know, when you think about pizza, you don't only think about the crust. Right? Pizza means there is crust there, but there's also cheese there. And there's also, you know, other stuff on it. But when you call whoever, you know, you want to call pizza, Domino's, whatever. And say, please deliver pizza. You're not expecting somebody to bring a box with just the crust. No, pizza comes with the whole thing. And that's like salvation. Salvation is forgiveness, healing, deliverance, preservation. It's the whole thing. So why are we serving people only the crust? And saying the other is only for some people. No. Salvation is the whole thing. And salvation is for everyone. That means healing is for every person. Amen? So, the next time you go to pray for somebody, go with this heart. God wants this person well. Whether, does it, just don't even worry about their background. Are they saved? Are they not saved? Are they, you know tall or short, none of that matters. Or the religious background, doesn't matter. God wants this person well. And connected to that is the next question, which is on page 89. 
Is it right to pray if it be thy will when ministering healing and deliverance? Now let me ask you this question. If a sinner came, if somebody came to the altar and said, you know, I want to receive my sins forgiven. I want to have my sins forgiven. I heard you tell me that Jesus died on the cross and he took my sins. And whoever believes in Jesus will receive forgiveness of sins. So I'm here. I want to receive forgiveness for my sins. Would you ever pray and say, Lord, if it is your will, please forgive him his sins. Otherwise, pack him to hell. <laughs> would you ever pray that way? Why? You would never pray that way because you know that on the cross, Jesus took his sins and all he needs to do is to believe and his sins will be forgiven. You would never pray, if it be thy will, forgive his sins. Never. Now, why is it when it comes to healing, we are saying, if it be thy will, heal. Hey, it's the same cross. It's the same cross. But Jesus did the work. So why is it that when it comes to forgiveness of sins, we don't even hesitate to say, if it be thy will, forgive his sins. But when it comes to healing, we become super spiritual. Now we say, Lord, if it be thy will. Hey, something is wrong. It is not right to pray, if it be thy will, where the will of God has already been revealed. God's will has already been revealed. The cross stands there. And on the cross, he bore our sins. He took our sicknesses and everything. So it's not right even to pray, if it be thy will. The will of God's been revealed. It is his will to heal every sick person. Amen? Did the Lord Jesus ever pray for one sick person using, Father, if it be thy will, heal him? Did the Lord Jesus pray even once like that? Guys. Did the Lord Jesus pray even once like that? Never. So what right do you, you and I have to create a theology that permits us to do that when Jesus himself never did that? Not once did he pray for any sick person saying, Father, if it be thy will, heal him or deliver him. Never. The only time Jesus prayed about the will of was in the garden of Gethsemane when he was about to go to the cross. That was the only time when he prayed, he said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That was the only time. It had nothing to do with healing. It had to do with him surrendering to the plan of, of God, to the purpose of God, he had to go to the cross for the redemption of man. And then he said, if there's any other way to do it, but if there's no other way, I'm willing. Not my will, thy will. It wasn't praying about healing. So don't take that prayer and use it in healing and deliverance. That was a prayer. He prayed to surrender himself to the purpose of God. Amen? So you and I, when we are ministering to the sick people, first, there is no doubt in our minds that God wants that person well. Secondly, when we pray, we do not pray if it be thy will because we know the will of God. God's will is to heal just as much as God's will is to forgive sins. Amen? Next question. Page 90. Since God is sovereign, won't he just heal people if and when he wants to? Now we know God's a sovereign God, which means he can do whatever he pleases, and that is true. And there are times when God will move sovereignly and he will heal people, regardless. There have been testimonies I've heard, even of our own services, you know, people come, they visit one service and they go away. Years later, I meet them and say, hey, we came to your service. We came to service on that such as a Sunday. And I remember one person telling me, he brought his mother. They just attended one service. 
His mother had a frozen sh- shoulder. I forget which shoulder, but his mother had a frozen shoulder. Some problem there. She hadn't been able to move it. They attended one service. This was many years ago. And I met this person many years after that. And he said, you know, we came to the church for one service. My mother was healed. Nobody prayed for her. And this was years ago. Nobody did anything. God just moved sovereignly. I don't even know when it happened. But many years later, he comes and says this testimony. Right? So like that, God moves sovereignly amongst our midst. And uh, people who are least expecting it, they're not even praying. They're just minding their own business in service, waiting for the long sermon to get over. And probably they're asleep during the sermon. And when they wake up, they realize God's healed them. God just moves sovereignly. That's the sovereignty of God. And yes, God does those kinds of things. And I pray that he will do more of those things. That God just, without anybody praying, even without any expecting God, that they just get healed and more and more, let more and more of that happen. And yes, God does that. We're praying for more of that to happen. But the fact is, those are the exceptions. And the norm is that God works together with us to bring his healing and deliverance. So he just doesn't simply move around and randomly do things. We break our answer into three parts. The first thing we'll talk about is on page 91 is the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. God is sovereign. If he wanted to, he could have transported you with your bed to the service here this morning. I mean, he can do it, and I hope he does. <laughs> I mean, you might be sleeping in bed saying, okay, today I'm not going to church, and your bed just... <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're at the altar. <laughs> and God is sovereign. He can do it. I mean, you hear of Ezekiel being transported. Philip was transported. You know, God can do that. But there is the other side of it, which is the responsibility of man. And all of us here this morning are in church because we took up our responsibility of waking up, getting dressed, and coming to church. Is God sovereign? He's absolutely sovereign. He can bring any person in any time. But yet, there are most of the time, his sovereignty ends where our responsibility begins. You had to rise up to your responsibility this morning and make an effort to get to the service. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, is God sovereign? He's absolutely sovereign. But in the normal course of things, His sovereignty, He chooses to end His sovereignty where our responsibility begins. That's a choice He's made. And that's something we have to respond to. Saying, God, I understand you're sovereign. You can do as you please, but you put responsibility on me. And I'm rising up to my responsibility. Because you will not do what you placed on my end to do. There are times when God would do it. He he can transport people into the church service if he wants to. He can. But the normal thing is he expects us. To rise up to our responsibility. So that's one answer. Why doesn't God just heal everyone? There's a responsibility he's put on our side. And so when it comes to the healing ministry on page 92, I just mentioned a couple of the responsibilities. It's our responsibility when we want to minister healing and deliverance to people. It's our responsibility to know the truth. It's our responsibility to know and learn how God works, to know um, our authority, our anointing, and learn how to flow with God to minister healing. That's our responsibility. So we as the people of God are ignorant of these truths. You know, 
we will never see any healing, never see, hardly see any healing or miracles. But that's what we're learning. That's what we're studying. That's what we're willing to, you know, discard some of our wrong ideas and embrace the truth so that God can work through us. We are fulfilling our side of the responsibility of equipping ourselves with the knowledge of the truth, with the anointing of God. Amen? The second part of answer to this question is about the sovereignty, sovereignty of God. This is on page 93. The sovereignty of God and the exercise of faith. God has determined out of his sovereignty that he will respond to the faith of people. That's something he determined. He is sovereign. And he decided to do that. That he will respond to the faith of people. In fact, what you find is that although he's sovereign, unbelief stops the work of God. You find those examples in Matthew 13, 58 and in Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. In his own hometown of Nazareth, the Bible says Jesus couldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. See, God is sovereign. He can do what he wants, but yet their unbelief stops his work. Why? Because in his sovereignty, he has determined that he will work only where there is faith. And yet, it's because he's determined that there is also times and places where when there is no faith and he will still work. Think for example, uh, the man who had a son who was troubled by demons. He comes to the disciples of Jesus. They couldn't help him. Uh, this is in Mark 9. And, and Jesus says, you know, uh, if you believe all things are possible to him who believes. And what was this man's response? He says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Meaning, Lord, I I'm trying to believe, but I saw your disciples couldn't do this. So that's really shaken my faith. You know, I've got a bad experience in church. I went for prayer and the pastor pushed me to the ground. I got up with a hurt, another hurt on my back, you know. So I went with one problem. I came back with two problems, God, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, he's had a bad experience in church. So he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Now, in that condition, Jesus still ministers to him. So there are exceptions. Think about the man of the pool of Bethesda. Uh, he was lying there in, Mark, in John 5 and Jesus goes to him and says, will you be made whole? And, and he's thinking like, Lord, you know, the doctors haven't come in today. The nurses have forgotten about me. And he's giving all the excuses. I mean, really what he says is, there's nobody who takes to take me and put me in the water. So he's not even connecting uh, with Jesus. He has no anticipation that Jesus is about to heal him. The next thing Jesus says is, rise, take up your bed and... So was there any faith there? No faith. Was there any expectation there? No expectation. And yet God, there's healing. So God is sovereign. Yes, there are times he ministers in spite of unbelief and in spite when there's no faith. But the norm is that his sovereignty is in response to our faith. He's chosen to work that way. So why doesn't God just simply heal everyone? Faith. Jesus died for everybody on the cross, but not everybody gets saved. Why? Because God wants each one to have faith. And those who believe will be saved. And the last thing we have to admit uh, when we are answering the qu is this question, it's on page 95, is that we walk by truth that's been revealed and search out what is unknown. That means, you know, we don't always have the answer why everybody doesn't get healed. Last Sunday was a great service. And, and at the end of the time, there was a, just a heightened time of worship. And I was just praying. I said, said God, just move sovereignly. Just heal people. Let people just discover that they've been healed. But we know that not every person gets healed. And, and, and we don't have an answer all the time. Why everyone doesn't get healed or why everyone you pray for doesn't get healed. But that does not prevent us from having faith. We walk by what we know. We do not let what we do not know stop us. Amen? We live by the word that has been revealed. And we try to search out for more answers. God, how do we minister better? How, what's keeping healing away from people? But Till that time, we just walk by what we know. 
We don't let the darkness out there prevent us from walking in the light that we already have. Amen? So yes, there are things we don't know. We have to search it out, but we walk by the truth that's been revealed. So that brings us to the next question on page 97, which is, why doesn't everyone get healed? And like I said, we readily admit that not every person we pray for a minister gets healed. And there could be many reasons. We'll talk about some of them later. Perhaps we're not ministering correctly. Sometimes there's a, phys there's a physical healing that just needs a, a, a ministry of healing. But sometimes it could be connected to demonic spirit. So you need to de minister deliverance. Sometimes it could be connected to uh, emotional issues. People are hurting emotionally. And so you may need to deal with the emotional issue first in order to bring physical healing. And so these are all interconnected. The spirit, soul, and body is interconnected. And so maybe we're not ministering the right way. Uh, 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 there could be many reasons. And, and, and we know we don't see every person we pray for get healed. But what we do or how we react to the fact that not every person gets healed is very important. And that's what I want to emphasize now. What should we do when... Every person we minister to does not get healed. What should our response be? Page 98. Firstly, don't compromise the truth. Don't change the truth just to explain a failure. The truth is absolute. Any failure is not on God's side. It's on our side. And we have no authority to change the word of God to explain away our failure. Don't change the truth. Jesus Christ is the same. He's the healer. Secondly, don't speculate. Simply admit, I don't know. Don't tell the person, you know, you didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith or I don't know, you came on the wrong day, you know, or don't make, don't speculate. Just say, look, right now, I don't know exactly why it didn't happen. I don't know. But what must we do? The third point. Ask God for insight and keep on ministering. That means you say, God, I prayed for this person one time. Nothing happened. Can you show me? Can you reveal to me what must I do to minister healing to this person? What is it that's stopping the flow of healing power? What is the thing that's hindering this, this healing? How do I bring your healing power? Ask God for insight and continue ministry. Maybe we're ministering wrong. Maybe we're not hitting the root cause and so we need to find out. Or maybe uh, there's something else that needs to be done. So ask God for insight and say, God, how do you want me to minister to this person? Continue ministering. Are you with me so far? Yeah. But don't change your theology. Don't point fingers and put the blame on the person. And page 99 Glorify God, not the condition. You know, don't say things like, man, if you had come to me when you were in stage one cancer, maybe you got here now with stage four or whatever, it's too bad. I mean, no, for God, it doesn't matter. So glorify God, not the condition. It doesn't matter what the condition is. It doesn't matter how long the condition has, may have been. Don't be impressed by it. Our God is the healer. And we glorify God, not the problem. Don't let the seriousness of that rob our faith. Amen? And another important thing. Remember that God will still work in spite of the sickness, not because of the sickness. Don't give sickness the credit. You know, sometimes in certain circles in a Christian world, as a person is sick and, 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 and God uses them, they say, yeah, yeah, you know, God is using them because of their sick. I think that's wrong. He's not using them because they're sick. He's using them in spite of their I mean, think about this. You know, let's say you have this guy who is a really great musician. 
really good. He can sing well and, and he's really talented. Uh, but let's say he drinks, he smokes, he's on drugs. And, and then, you know, he somehow manages to come on stage and lead worship. You know, I'm saying somehow because we normally won't let that happen. But, but let's say, you know, he comes on stage, he leads worship, and God's presence moves powerfully. Lives are touched. Would you say, hey, God moved because he was smoking and drinking? You wouldn't say that. What would we say? We would say, you know, thank God for his mercy. God moved even though he was smoking and in spite of what he was doing, God still moved. Now, why is it we change it the other way when it comes to sickness? No. When a person is sick and God's using him or her, we say, God's working in spite of, not because of. Are you with me? Amen. And what we see in church history is there have been men of God <clears throat> who, while they were still struggling with certain personal ailments, even men like Smith Wigglesworth, uh, they had their own problems uh, at different points in their lives, but God still used them so powerfully in healing and deliverance. And, but they had their own struggles. And God was working in spite of that, not because of that. He works. He used them. So always glorify God, not the condition. And lastly, this is on page 100. Keep pressing in for more. That's our desire. You know, thank God for every small healing, every healing we see. If it's a small condition, thank God for it. Say, God, we want to see greater things. God, Lord, we want to see people heal of all kinds of sickness, all kinds of diseases. We want to see more, more, more. And we keep pressing in until we do the works that Jesus did. And then we don't stop because he said you can do greater works. So he said, God, we want to see more. We want to see greater works than what Jesus said. We press on for more and more. Our responsibility is to keep pressing in. Amen? Until we see the works that God wants done released. A couple of related questions here. Why are some healings gradual? In the ministry of Jesus, we know that every person he prayed for got healed, Im got healed immediately except for one person, one recorded case uh, in the Gospel of Mark where we see this man, the blind man. This is in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. This blind man from Bethsaida uh, who, who Jesus had to pray twice. But in all other cases, his, his ministry, healings were immediate. People got he healed immediately. Now, when we know, when we minister to people, most of the time we see healings gradually. It happens over time. Our response must be that we celebrate every little improvement. Celebrate it. How do we explain this man? And I'm jumping around here. Let me explain. Let's explain this man and then come back to how we minister. You know, why is it that Jesus probably had to pray uh, prayed for this man twice? And uh, we could probably... Uh, uh, frame a reason around what we know about that city of Bethsaida. Bethsaida was, four of Jesus' disciples came from that city, and Bethsaida was one of the cities that Jesus rebuked for their unbelief <clears throat> and their unreceptivity to his ministry. One of the cities. And so you can imagine this man in that city where people were in unbelief and unreceptive. And so when they brought this man to Jesus, what does Jesus do? He takes them, him out of the city. Taking him out of an environment of unbelief. Taking him out of an environment that was unreceptive to his ministry. Take him out of the city. And minister to him. And this man probably was already filled with unbelief. So the moment he saw little healing, little improvement, faith arose in his heart saying something's happening. And he now reached out and was able to receive complete healing in his life. One other instance when Jesus sent people out was when he went to pray for Jairus' daughter. That all these people, they mocked Jesus when he came. So what does he do? He puts them all out. He only has the parents and Peter, James, and John with him as he raises that woman, that girl back to life. So we learn the importance of creating an environment of faith, and faith for people. We learn 
to celebrate every little improvement so that faith can rise. Oh, something is happening. So I know God can do more. If he's doing this much, I know he can do some more. So faith is inspired and they are able to receive. They're a complete healing. And we celebrate every improvement we see. We celebrate. We say, thank you, God. Do more in that person's life. Amen? Why are some healings? Next question. Why are some healings partial and not complete? Don't worry. The end of the chapter is drawing nigh. Your redemption draweth nigh. So lift up your heads. <laughs> Two more pages. Why are some healings partial and not complete? You know, we all have experienced that. You know, let's say a person has three problems in their body. You pray your best prayer and only one gets healed. And they still carry two more problems in the body. And like, God, you know, I mean, if you heal one, why don't you just deal with the other two? We all experience that. And <clears throat> we don't have all the answers. But some possible reasons are is because the cause for those conditions are different. So they have to be addressed differently. So one may be a purely physical, organic problem. You've ministered healing, fine. The other could be because of a, of a spirit of infirmity and you need to deal with that spirit. You need to cast it out. And you find Jesus doing the same thing. There are some people that he just lays his hands on. They're healed. They're, they're able to speak or hear. In other cases, he has to cast out a spirit in order for them to hear and speak. So, different. Sometimes their problems could be connected to an emotional issue. So you bring healing in that emotional area so that healing can come in their physical body. Right? So you minister differently for different conditions in the body. So the point is that when we see that only one has been healed, we pray and say, God, how else should I continue ministering to this person? How else do I do it? You know? and, and, and deal with the other conditions in their body and continue ministering that way. Don't give up. Even when you see partial healings and not complete healings. Three hard attitudes we must have. Page 103. That allow God to work, healings, miracles is faith, expectancy, and desire. Have that desire all the time. In your heart, God, I want to see things. I want you to use me. I want to receive healing. Have faith, expectation, and intense desire. What could be some of the hindrances to healing? I'm on the last page, 104. <clears throat> and here's just a, a list of possible reasons. There could be a lack of knowledge, and that's why we need to teach people the Word of God, teach them the truth, and let them know that God wants to heal them. There could be a lack of faith. If you consider the ailment as the will of God, then, you know, if, if, if you consider that as God's blessing in your life, then why would you want to let go of it? Hold on to it. A lack of a persistent desire to get well. Sometimes you enjoy the attention, you know, food is being served, flowers are being brought. This is nice, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we become passive in resisting sickness. The sickness has to be resisted. But if we are passive, you know, we think God will heal me in his time, sometime in the future. Then we become passive. Sometimes we have wrong hard attitudes as we talked about earlier. If there's jealousy, it, it ruins the person's health. Jealousy is rottenness to the bones. A broken spirit, a wounded spirit, again affects the person's health. There could be destructive lifestyles. The person doesn't want to give up certain things. So then there could be other unknowns that, that actually hinder healing from coming. The point here <clears throat> this morning is, I know we've addressed, this, addressed some difficult questions, but I really want to encourage us to step out and minister healing to people, healing and deliverance to people. Even though there may be all these other questions around. There are some things that we know for sure. God wants to heal every person. We know the cross is for them. Jesus died for them. And so we will step out and minister. And even if nothing happens, we don't get discouraged. Because we know that we can continue ministering. Look for other ways. Ask the Lord for insight. And as we continue studying, we'll be talking about several aspects that, that are involved in bringing healing and deliverance. And, and, and as we learn that, we can minister more effectively to people. But the best thing to do is to start acting on this. Start ministering. See what happens. And every time we minister, you're learning. You're learning all the time on, on, on how God's healing power is released to people. Amen? 
Let's stand to our feet, please. You know, let's just act on what we've heard this morning. God, let your healing flow in this, press, in this place. Let your healing presence move upon people who need your touch this morning, God. Make all things new in their bodies. Heal every condition. Heal. Lord God, let your presence just, let your healing presence just Flow through this auditorium, God. Flow through this place. Even as we pray for one another, as we minister to one another. I also take authority in the name of Jesus over every spirit of infirmity. Over every work of darkness. And I break every demonic yoke of affliction, of sickness, disease, and I declare people free in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I declare people free. Spirit of God, we just welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you. Just move upon the people here. Let a healing word to flow, making people whole, oh God, in this place. The minds and their bodies. Let a healing word to flow making people whole in this place we thank you God we thank you oh God we thank you God we just thank you and as prayer has been made you will find improvement in your body and feel free to share that feel free to testify about it tell people you know, this is what's happening. This is what God is doing for me. Testify about it. Share what God is doing for you in your body. Thank you, oh God. Let's just worship for a few moments and then be close. Walk with me through fire and heal my disease. I trust in you. I trust in you. I believe your. Jesus 
Father, we just thank you for what you are doing in our lives and in our hearts as you prepare us, as you equip us. And Father, we just thank you for the day coming, God. When healing and deliverance will flow like a mighty river out of us as a community. If you will, you'll use us, Lord, to be a healing and a delivering community in our city and in our nation, God. Even as we pray and as we press into this, that we will see the power of God released and at work amongst us. And we thank you for the works of healing taking place even now as we've prayed this morning. We thank you for what you are doing. And we ask for more. We ask you to increase it even more, Father. For your glory, for your honor, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's get ready to close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. And lift up his countenance on you. And give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Go out there and just minister to as many people as you can. Amen. Come and share testimonies. Tell us what the Lord's doing. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.